For today's discussion, I want to keep it very brief. I want to focus on three points, the distinction between title and sovereignty. Secondly, the court's decision regarding when settler sovereignty began in British Columbia. And thirdly, why this legal assertion is fundamentally flawed for so many reasons. First, let me turn to the distinction between title and sovereignty. This is a legal question, but one I think that's quite important for us to understand as we come to grips with the very important issues of land and uh, sovereignty over the land. I'm sure most, if not all of you, are aware of the many Aboriginal title cases that have occurred in the past few decades, including the Delgamuk case and Tsilkotin. For a long time, these were considered cases regarding title. We now know, however, that much more was and is at stake. When we use the term land title, a European term, we are generally referring to ownership of a particular parcel of land. But because you own a particular parcel of land, it does not mean that you are sovereign on that land. Generally, title over a particular parcel of land is often referred to as fee simple. This allows the owner to occupy, to lease, uh, 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 or sell the land. But the land and its owner remain subject to the sovereign power. In colonial Canada, this usually includes the federal and provincial governments. First Nations land claims began as an assertion of title. But Aboriginal title now means much more and is currently bumping into questions of sovereignty. So how does sovereignty relate to title? The Supreme Court of Canada describes it this way. At the time of assertion of European sovereignty, the crown acquired radical or underlying title to all the land in the province. In other words, there is title, but the sovereign power also holds this radical or underlying title. So even if you have the title to the land, the sovereign power still controls uh, the use and the, um, uh, the final judgment on to how that land may be disposed of. Sovereignty is also a term used by First Nations in British Columbia, and they claim it as their own. And so the First Nations Leadership Council states the concepts of sovereignty and reconciliation are central to understanding the purpose of consultation and accommodation. It's important to understand both concepts, title and sovereignty. So let's look now at how the courts <coughs> determine the date and method by which supposedly the settler state gained sovereignty. This is a quote uh, from Justice Vickers in the Tsilkotin decision uh, at the Supreme Court of British Columbia in 2007, where he clarified, and I quote, in, in examining the various legal decisions relating to Aboriginal title, I got a serious, oh, uh, sorry, this is me speaking, I got a serious wake-up call. Uh, the assertion of European sovereignty over the territories derived from what is called the Treaty of or uh, Washington of 1846, more often referred to as the Oregon Treaty. And so Justice Vicker said, I have no difficulty in concluding that the Treaty of Oregon 1846 is a watershed date that the courts have relied upon up to now. I see no reason to move from that date. Indeed, as the province has argued, the authorities would appear to be too well entrenched to admit any reconsideration at this level of court. So every level of court, uh, including the appeal court and the Supreme Court of Canada, have stated that the legal basis for settler sovereignty, that is the government of Canada and the government of British Columbia, is the Treaty of Oregon. I mean, really, who knew? Are we teaching the Treaty of Oregon in our history books? Mm, not that I know of. It seems to be a well-hidden secret, but one that is important to examine from a critical perspective, which is what we're supposed to be doing. And after reading um, what uh, our premier said in the newspaper, I, I brought an artifact. I was taught very early on in working with indigenous peoples that you don't talk about 
indigenous artifacts as artifacts. They're treasures. But I think I can call this an artifact. <laughs> he said regarding the pipeline, uh, natural gas pipeline up north, all the permits are in place for this project to proceed. It will be proceeding. He added that the rule of law applies in British Columbia. So that's the uh, point that we're looking at. It's what is the law and whose law are we talking about? The whole state apparatus, in fact, supposedly derives from this 1846 treaty. So quickly, uh, a history lesson. What was the colonial landscape like uh, before the Treaty of Oregon? This is a map of the US territories and a little bit of the British possessions, they call them. And you'll see that Mexico goes right up to the Spanish Treaty Line of 1819. That's a treaty signed between Spain, that had colonized Mexico, and the United States. But you'll see Oregon country British US 1818 to 1846. So this right up to Alaska was considered not British Columbia. It was considered to be a place called Oregon country. It shows that the board is imposed in the 1820s, encompasses all of this province, what we now call British Columbia, right down to the bottom of Oregon. The important point here is that neither the British or the US asserted sovereignty. They neither could claim sovereignty because they both wanted the control of the whole of Oregon territory. Of course, indigenous people were excluded from the discussions. Here's what the claims were. If you'll see, the green section is claimed by both Britain and the United States, and the orange or red section is claimed uh, by the United States alone. So the United States wants all this area down in the south, Plus, it wants all the area up top. So this is the uh, discussions in the negotiations between the British and Americans in 1845. And they had occurred over a number of times earlier. But in the final discussions in 1845, we see that uh, the final map and the boundary that's established is the boundary that extends from the Rockies over to Tawasan, which I visited this morning, very early, <laughs> and through the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Uh, this was very difficult negotiations. The courts said this treaty, this Oregon Treaty, is the one that gives settlers the right to be the sovereign power. The problem with the court's decision is that they did not examine the content of the actual discussions that took place between the British and the Americans. And if you go back, as all good historians do, to the primary documents, what we find in the discussions is the basis for their assertion of sovereignty was this, Captain Cook, John Mears, Captain Vancouver, Alexander Mackenzie, David Thompson, Hudson's Bay Company. So they said, basically, uh, the British said, we discovered the Pacific Northwest. And therefore, it's ours. The Americans said, no, no, no. Captain Gray discovered the Columbia River. Right? Lewis and Clark traveled down and came to right to, into Oregon. Yeah? The territory, it's ours. They fought. Finally. In 1846, because the Americans went to war with, Me uh, with Mexico, the Americans decided to cut a deal, and they cut the deal along that 49th parallel down past here uh, through the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and they divided up the land. And so British Columbia, what we now call British Columbia, became British territory, and uh, the southern part became U.S. territory, south of the 49th parallel. Of course, in doing so, in drawing the line, they completely ignored indigenous people. And they in divided indigenous people, including the Saanich people from their Lummi brothers and sisters, uh, the Makah people from their Muchalnath peoples. They did that, and they did it 
knowing that they, even though they asserted that they had discovered and settled the area and that was the basis for asserting their sovereignty, in fact, they knew at the time that was an outright lie. The reason why it's so bogus as a claim and unsupportable and Premier Horgan frankly should be ashamed of putting forward what he does in this article. Because if you look at this, for him to say about the law applying in British Columbia is to talk about the settler law. And to reiterate, basically they're saying, Horgan's saying and the Supreme Court is saying, Columbus discovered America, therefore it's ours. In this case, it's Captain Cook went around Vancouver Island, so it's ours. They're saying that today. Saying it 150 years ago, one might understand. Saying it today has been totally discredited by the assertions of the doctrine of discovery. And on top of that, they knew at the time, right? They were told by British people who knew what the situation was that in fact there was 100,000 or more First Nations sitting and living and working in this land uh, and there was at most a couple of hundred uh, people who were not even settlers. They were basically working in the fur trade posts that had been established by the Hudson Bay Company and that's it, right? So on what basis can you assert sovereignty? There's no rationale even at the time, certainly less so now. And on top of that you have the whole history of British Columbia afterwards which results in the denial of the right to vote for indigenous peoples, the refusal to negotiate treaties, uh, and the continued violation of the United Nations Declaration and the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission action items. So on that basis, I say we have a problem. The settler government has a problem. We have a problem too because the settler government doesn't know it has a problem. And our job now is to make sure they find out that they do. The people up north of Wet'suwet'en are standing up for their rights, their legal rights, and I think they deserve our support. Thank you very much.